Welcome to The Criminologist, the podcast dedicated to educating and entertaining our listeners. We bring you subject matter experts from around the world and share the latest and greatest evidence-based practices and interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency. This podcast avoids stereotypes and biases in favor of the lived experiences of those we can best learn from. Now, please welcome the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Hello and welcome to episode 123 of The Criminologist podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. This week, we are joined once again by friend of the podcast, Dr. Jared Brown of Concordia University in St. Paul, as well as the American Institute for the Advancement of Forensic Studies. This week, Dr. Brown and I are going to continue our series on profiling and providing case studies of infamous serial killers. This time around, taking a look at J.J. Holmes. Now, we did this back in episode 105 when we did a case study profiling infamous serial killer, Albert Fish. Please do yourselves a favor and go back and check out that episode. Now, as we noted then, Please note that Dr. Brown and I are not using these cases to glamorize the offender or for shock value, but rather to illustrate these crimes and behaviors as a case study for you all to learn from. If you've never experienced one of Dr. Brown's interviews, do yourself a favor, go back, listen to all of them. Dr. Brown is a wealth of information. We absolutely love having him on the program. Let's begin, though, with a brief bio of Dr. Brown. He is a professor, trainer, researcher, and consultant with multiple years of experience teaching collegiate courses. Jared is currently an assistant professor, program director, and lead developer for the Master of Arts degree in Human Services with an emphasis in forensic behavioral health and a second emphasis area in trauma, resilience, and self-care strategies for Concordia University in St. Paul, Minnesota. Now, in addition to this experience, Jared has provided consultation services to a number of caregivers, professionals, and organizations pertaining to the topics related to autism spectrum disorder, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, confabulation, suggestibility, trauma and other life adversities, traumatic brain injury, as well as youth fire setting. Jared has also conducted numerous trainings for professional and student audiences. He is the founder and CEO of the American Institute for the Advancement of Forensic Studies and Editor-in-Chief of Forensic Scholars Today. And now, enjoy Dr. Brown's profile of infamous serial killer, J.J. Holmes. And I will see you all on the other side. Welcome back to the show, Jared. Always a pleasure to have you on the show, my friend. Today, we are going to continue our series, if you will, of highlighting or showcasing or utilizing infamous serial killers, not to glamorize, of course, but sort of use as a as a template or a backdrop for some of the contemporary things that our human service professionals may be dealing with today in the individuals that they supervise or interact with. So why don't we kick it off, Jared, by for those listeners who may not know anything about H.H. Holmes, maybe introduce our listeners to that individual, if you would, please. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Joe, for having me back. So H.H. Holmes is one of the most unusual and disturbing cases in American history when it comes to serial killers, but his case is just so unique compared to other cases I've examined. If you dig into this literature, there's been a lot of books written on him, different documentaries, 
lots of crime shows that have pulled elements of his story in there. One thing I want to really stress to your listeners today is that H.H. H. Holmes was an extremely compulsive liar, and the media at that time really glamorized things and took things out of context. So everything I'm presenting today, we don't know if it's 100% accurate, unfortunately, but I've written an article on this uh, on this individual a handful of years ago. You're more than welcome to share with your audience and really dug into him and looked at everything I could possibly find online, documentaries, books, newspaper articles. So that's basically my goal today is to kind of summarize everything I've learned. He was born by a different name. Some people I don't think realize that. His birth name was Herman Webster Muggett. Later on, several years later, he ended up changing his name to Henry Howard Holmes, H.H. Holmes. And if you look deep into like the reportings on him back in the day, they claimed that he was the first serial killer in American history. Not, definitely not true, but he was one of the first that got this kind of like notoriety and press and they wrote about him. He was born in 1861 and he died in 1896. So he died at the age of 35 because of execution, but we'll get to that point in a few minutes. He was born into a double parent household. Most people were back then, mom and dad. Um, father's occupation, everything I could find. Some, some reports indicated he was a farmer, a trader, or a house painter, or all of the above. When we dissected Albert Fish's case, if you remember, Joe, his dad worked in a fertilizer plant, and I brought up I says, I'm wondering if this is, could anything be re- related to like environmental chemical exposure as well as a million other factors? I'll put it out there too. If his father at that time was a house painter, was his father exposed to a lot of lead from the paint? Did that have any genetical kind of genetic predisposition, any epigenetic changes, any anything going on genetically. I don't know, but I want to just put it out there as something for us to think about. Mom's occupation, teacher. They were Christian. We'll get into his childhood in a little bit. Um, everything I could find too on him, he was he had three other siblings. Not a lot of information out there about his siblings how they got along at that age. But again, keep in mind, he was born in 1861. So the records obviously weren't the same as they are now. His case, fascinating, terrifying. The article I wrote on him, it was one of the most viewed articles I've ever written. Somehow I just, people seem to be fascinated by his case. So if we look, if you go deep into this kind of literature too, He had a lot of names that were given to him over the years and back in that day. So the press called him the Beast of Chicago, the Torture Doctor. He ended up going to med school. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And he was a doctor, which plays into some of the things I'm going to talk about today. They called him the Monster of 63rd Street and a a number of other names. So a lot of these serial killers have other names given to them in the popular media or press at that time. He was referred to back in that time too, when people learned about what he did, the press called him a criminal mastermind, a murderous monster. He was a prolific and gifted swindler. He was a fraud, a cheat, just an extreme compulsive liar, engaged in insurance fraud, He was very charming and likable as well, so we really want to take that into account. He was an entrepreneur, and he was really motivated by money. A lot of the serial killers that we'll be digging into in this series were not motivated by money at all, maybe somewhat, but he was truly motivated by money. So inside, he was a very, very disturbed individual on the outside 
he oftentimes presented himself as a big charmer. So he was able to manipulate people and to con them and trick them into different things. Joe, I want to just spend a little time on his childhood. I think we're always fascinated by that. That's where I always love to start. And one thing I would say, don't start with, if you're trying to like profile a case or really understand human behavior, we don't start in childhood. We start in utero. That's where it begins. I know nothing about his prenatal history. I cannot find anything anywhere about prenatal trauma, what was going on with his mom during birth, during pregnancy. There's a lot of unanswered questions there that I wish we knew, but we just don't. But his childhood, depending on what you believe, some people said he grew up in a very normal, stable child had a stable childhood, but other reports, and most of the reports kind of regurgitate the same thing, where he was born into a wealthy family, both parents, but some of the articles in the newspaper press really indicated that his parents were intensely religious, and they used their beliefs on him and the children in a really cold and strict disciplinary manner. Is that true or not? We don't know with certainty, but that's something to keep in mind when we profile a case like this. So if he did grow up in a home where there was a lot of really lack of parental warmth, absolutely something we need to take into account. There are some reports that Holmes' mother at a certain age early on in life ended up getting a medical illness and, and died eventually unfortunately from that and that created a lot of stress and trauma for the entire family there were also reports that his father was an alcoholic and his father would abuse him and the children so we if that is true we have family history of alcoholism we have early exposure to various forms of abuse and maltreatment he was bullied in school as well And he was bullied because he was a highly intelligent individual, but came off as very odd and awkward and socially awkward. And there were plenty of reports that I came across early on in his life. He didn't have a lot of friends. So he was really kind of withdrawn and awkward, but highly intelligent. So other kids bullied him. And there was one incident that consistently comes up in the things you read about him. When he was young, I don't know at what age, but a couple of his classmates grabbed him against his will and forced him into like a local doctor's office. I don't think the doctor was there and there was a skeleton in there and they put the skeleton's hand on his face and Holmes indicated this was kind of the turning point in a way where he was terrified of like skeletons, human anatomy. But when that happened, something shifted in him where he became very interested and almost obsessed with human anatomy and skeletons and death. So take that into account as well. This, I think, propelled him into medicine. And there is some reports too, when he was going through this abuse from his father, And then after this bowling happened with the exposure to the skeleton over his face, he would run into the nearby woods and start to experiment and torture animals where it started out where he would trap animals and perform surgery on them, starting with reptiles, but then later moved into mammals such as dogs and rabbits. There's some indication that that might have happened. So we have some early red flag indicators that things might not be going too well. There's a few reports too, and most of those reports, again, they're just kind of regurgitating the same thing other people are saying. One of his friends, when he, when Holmes was 11, he had a childhood friend who was a little older than him, and they were at some sort of abandoned house or building, and it was just the two of them. And why the two of them were exploring it, his friend fell and ended up dying. There is some speculation that some people think did Holmes actually push him and that was the first murder. We don't know, but some people speculate that. So that was at the age of 12. At the age of 16, 
he graduated high school. And a couple years later, there's a lot of other things I don't want to bore your audience with, but just give them kind of highlights. A couple years later, he ended up attending the University of Vermont for a period of time, but he was kind of bored and not happy with the curriculum there. So then a short period of time later, he ended up going to the University of Michigan where he studied medicine and surgery. And he obtained his degree in 1884 from there. While at med school, he, he was, again, motivated by money. There was a lot of indications that he was starting to, to lie and, and come up with different schemes. And there were certain schemes where he was able to make money by supposedly like selling the skeletons back to the school at that time. And that was a way for him to make money and digging up skeletons and things of that nature. So after he graduated in 1884, he worked various odd jobs for a period of time. And during that time he was married and had a young son. And there is some speculation that he may be engaged in domestic violence because people reported they saw him and his wife arguing a lot. But again, it, it, it could be just speculation. He had three wives, as far as I know, throughout his lifetime, and he died at 35. And by all accounts, he never divorced any of them, and they did not know of each other. So he had three wives technically at the time of his death, but he abandoned in two of the three wives before that case. At a couple years after then he graduated, he ended up moving to Chicago. And if I think a lot of people are probably with his case familiar with the, like the murder castle that he developed, wild, wild stories. Is it all true? Probably not. Some of it absolutely is without a doubt. But so when he moved to Chicago, a period of time, he established himself, made more money, and there's a lot of other things in there. But he eventually started construction on what was later to be called the Murder Castle. And the construction, I believe, started in 1889. And after it was constructed, this was a very large facility that had well over 100 rooms. It had, I think, two or three levels. One of the levels was for patrons who could stay there for a short period of time for a hotel and then their offices on one level and businesses on another level. He had various employees. This is where kind of his legend grows or after he got caught doing the things he did, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, they supposedly found law enforcement. They found secret passages and trap doors and soundproof rooms and rooms that had gas going into it where he could asphyxiate his, just suffocate his victims there in the basement. They supposedly found a dissecting table, a stretching rack, a, a place where he could cremate some of his victims. Some of the victims, supposedly he was able to remove their skin and all other tissue because of his experience being a medical doctor and actually selling those skeletons then to other schools as a form of profit. So a lot of this was motivated by profit. He, he engaged in many horrific things with his victims. We don't know how many victims he has for sure. He was only convicted of one speculated and many others, depending on what you look at, they, they think somewhere maybe around 27, he admitted to, they could only find maybe linking him to around nine, but some people say that he may be linked to more than 200. So it's really the numbers are all, all over the map. Again, did his first victim happen when he was at the age of 11 and he pushed his friend? Maybe. Along his lifetime, there were other people that went missing and lots of things that just didn't seem to add up with him. He tortured people, engaged in mutilation. He, hang, he hung some of his victims. He put some of his victims in a vault to die by hunger and thirst. So it, again, it was really all over the map. And then eventually he got caught for something non-related to, to homicide. It was a, a fraud-related situation. And then when he was in custody, they were able to find out he, he did kill one of his partners in it was really involved in kind of an insurance scheme fraud. So that's kind of how this all crumbled. So at his conviction, he was only convicted of one murder. He was actually hung. 
And there were a lot of speculation after that happened. H.H. H. Holmes, also known as Herman Mudgett, was born on May 16th, 1861, in Gilmantown, New Hampshire, and died on May 7th, 1896, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Holmes was an American swindler and confidence trickster who is widely considered the country's first known serial killer. Holmes was born into a wealthy family and showed signs of high intelligence from an early age. Always interested in medicine, he allegedly trapped animals and performed surgery on them. Some accounts of his life even suggest that he killed a childhood playmate. Holmes attended medical school at the University of Michigan, where he was a mediocre student. In 1884, he was nearly prevented from graduating when a widowed hairdresser accused him of making a false promise of marriage to her. So if we were to recap his life based on what we think we might know, or at least what's documented in different biographies, books, uh, newspaper accounts. He grew up in a home, had an alcoholic father, had physical abuse from his father, potential grief and loss issues from the death of his mother. He was bullied by other, other kids he clearly, in my opinion, obviously had profound attachment issues. Anyone who does this obviously has some form of dysregulated attachment. So he really saw his victims as just a means to an end, a way to make money, a way to support his, his lifestyle. He had relationship conflicts. So he was married three times and he did not divorce any of these individuals. And there is a possible incident or multiple incidents of domestic violence with his first wife. He had violent attitudes, obviously, toward others. He experimented on live animals for fun. He was a compulsive cheater, a liar, a manipulator. He had kind of that fear to fascination spectrum where it started out as a fear and turned into a fascination with um, skeletons. He clearly had some level of obsessional behavior, particularly obsession with death. And he clearly always had a need to be in control. So those are the things that I see jumping out at me, just reviewing all of this information. Joe, I'll park the brakes. Any thoughts from your lens or any questions you may have about any of those things? I wouldn't, I'm wondering, Jared, could you maybe... I don't want to use the word assess because I would never assess somebody in this fashion, but maybe just take a look at Holmes through some of the lenses that a practitioner today may utilize. For example, looking at it through an ACES lens or looking at it through a criminogenic lens or any other forensic approach you would take to maybe, again, sort of connect some of the dots for folks supervising caseloads or interacting with caseloads today. Absolutely. Any case that I consult on, and if it, obviously if it's a complex case, and this is the most extreme complex case anyone would probably ever deal with, starting prenatally, what was going on during pregnancy? So Holmes' mom, what was going on in that household during pregnancy? Were they dealing with financial stressors? Was there unemployment going on? Housing stability? any exposure to violence, any kind of substance misuse, alcohol use? Was there the threat of separation or divorce? What, was there any conflict going on in that household? Any untreated mental health issues? Obviously through this lens too, prenatal care, what was going on nutritionally, medically, grief and loss issues. And then I would also want to know and dig a lot deeper into the relationship between mom and dad, what kind of distress was going on, if any, personal distress, family distress, social distress, educational or occupational or emotional. What were their sleep patterns like? Were they burnt out? Were they dealing with some grief and loss issues, negative thinking? 
Were they dealing with brain-based impairments? And was this a planned pregnancy? Did she want to be pregnant? Could that have contributed to any attachment issues in utero? Again, we don't know any of these things with certainty, but through a lens of today, I would want to know, was there any attachment-based traumas that happened in utero? So if you look through the attachment-based trauma lens, unplanned pregnancies, medical trauma, sexual assault, nutritional deficiencies, domestic violence during pregnancy, any exposure to community violence, maternal guilt or shame during pregnancy, Was mom dealing with any illnesses or disorders or disease or what was her health outcomes during pregnancy? And then looking at the literature of today, let's say someone was dealing with a high level of stress during pregnancy, that can have profound consequences on that developing child in utero. So if that, it was there trauma going on during, during pregnancy, What does the research say about in utero stress, particularly high levels of stress? It can contribute to preterm delivery in some cases, low birth weight. If we look at some of the neurocriminology literature of today, premature birth, poor birth outcomes, fetal distress, those factors have been studied within the the neurocriminology literature, higher levels of anxiety, depression, Conduct problems, these have all been studied within the context of higher levels of in utero stress. And then, let's say after the person is born, were they exposed to any kind of postnatal stressors or threats after birth? So that's where kind of that ACEs study comes in. What was going on in that family system during early childhood development? Did, did the parents have good parenting skills? Were they attuned and empathetic? There are some reports to maybe speculate that Holmes' parents may have lacked some warmth. So did they come off as very cold, mean, and callous? And Holmes and his siblings were always under distress or under a lot of fear or worry or kind of walking on eggshells and just didn't feel like that was a safe, stable, calm, and predictable environment. Did he not learn empathy from the people around him? He clearly, obviously had empathy problems, of course. So we need to look at that as well. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But again, if we look at some of the adverse childhood experiences literature, again, the overwhelming people of who've had horrific traumas never grow up to have these things. But just looking at the general ACEs literature, High levels of adverse childhood experiences early on in life can impact one's executive functioning capabilities, their brain, their thinking, their processing, how they relate to others, their social skill ability, their self-control, their regulation, their impulse control, the list goes on and on. Early exposure to childhood trauma can also impact speech and language communication, empathy problems, how we relate to peers, our intellectual functioning capability, our memory, the list goes on and on and on. If you look at some of the harsh parenting practices literature of today, what would a harsh parenting practice look like? I think these are good screening questions to be aware of if you're working on any case right now. Overly strict, if you're using a a fear-based approach or a non-empathetic-based approach or even shaming or threatening or being extremely critical to your child, what happens if the parent has rage control issues, yells and screams and just doesn't know how to calm themselves down? Does the parent use verbal or physical threats as punishment? Or does the parent use guilt on the children or or just constantly shame them or humiliate them? And then children, if they've grown up in these environments, what kind of post-traumatic responses may be at play through a trauma lens? You may see more social withdrawal. So they, again, they pull away from people. They may have a difficult time managing their intense emotions It can create more confusion. It can have a profound impact on their cognitive health. You may have higher levels of fear, helplessness, shock, disbelief. And in some cases, people with these extensive trauma histories 
may engage in emotional suppression knowingly or unknowingly where they suppress their emotions and never show their emotions to other people because emotions are so scary and that can really dampen the way in which they interact and communicate and, and present to other people and it can also contribute to empathy problems and intimacy deficits to name a few joe do you want me to talk about kind of some of the bowling literature of today as well yeah, please. I wanted to also commend you, Jared, for bringing up the issue of prenatal assessment, if you will. I think that's really an area that that needs to be explored and 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 really delved into more. I can tell you that from a just from my experience as a correctional practitioner, probation and parole, it's it's one thing if we could get a, a practitioner with an adult caseload to maybe look at that client's juvenile file, although not to sound too cynical, but at best, they're maybe taking a look at the at the criminal history program failures, you know, stuff like that. Um, But to think that it really needs to go even beyond that, as you noted, into some of the, the prenatal stuff, that's just not happening. And I've learned so much from you over the years, Jared, up to and including a recent neurocriminology webinar that you did with APHIS. I just think for any of my listeners out there who want to carve out their own special special niche, if you will, start looking at some of Dr. Brown's stuff around neurocriminology. I really think that's going to be the best frontier, and it will expose you to so many other things that you will look back and say, boy, I wish I knew knew then what I knew now. For example, Jared, when you started talking about um, executive function deficits, again, from I can tell you as a risk, need, responsivity champion, that's not something we touch on to the degree that we should, executive functioning deficits, but we know what a critical role that plays. So yeah, thank you again for for moving the dial back into the into that in, in utero space, if you will. Yeah, go ahead and proceed with the bullying stuff, Jared. I, you're doing a great job of profiling here. Yeah, you, thank you, Joe. I appreciate the comments. So Holmes' is history, we have the bullying, remember, but let's give everyone just a little general overview of the, the literature of bullying today. Bullying is very common. I was bullied really bad in grade school. So we're, we're all bullied at some point, probably on some level. So most people that have been bullied are not going to be doing these things, obviously. But bullying can take many different forms. You could, there's physical forms of bullying. That's obvious, like if someone's hitting or kicking someone. There's relational types of bullying where maybe someone is part of a, a friendship group, kind of, but that group is always gossiping or ignoring them or kind of leaving them out of stuff. That's a type of relational bully. Verbal bullying is the most common form. There's actually something called material bullying where someone would like try to steal or damage another person's things. And now in the area of obviously the internet, cyber bullying, we need to absolutely be aware that that is a huge, huge issue. So bullying can take many shapes, sizes, and forms. Verbal threats, harassment, physical intimidation, social exclusion, taunting someone, spreading rumors online or face-to-face, slapping someone or shoving them, and then that use of the technology. Maybe it's threatening text messages. Maybe it's putting something up in a chat room, a video or something that might not be true about them to try to ruin their reputation. If you look at the literature of today, the long-term effects of chronic bullying, it can impact one's trust issues. The person can have ongoing feelings of anger or bitterness or even a desire for revenge in some cases. Bullying can impact one's social skills. It can have a profound impact on our physical health. So we might see higher incidence of sleep issues, digestive health issues, body pain, headaches. It's been linked to higher levels of loneliness, problems with just wanting to be a loner all the time. And we know from the literature on long-term isolation and loneliness, that can lead to poor health outcomes, mental, emotional, and behavioral. Even from a neuro kind of biosocial lens, there is literature to support the fact that 
Long-term effects of bowling can really throw off our cortisol levels, our HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And it's also been linked to higher incidence of thyroid problems. So we need to look at this through a neurochemical lens, which thanks for bringing up the neurocriminology stuff. When I talk about that, I'm always talking about neurochemicals and hormones and transmitters. So important. And in some cases, long-term bowling can contribute to increases in self-injurious behavior, rage control issues, substance misuse. So that's kind of the research of today. Interestingly, through a neuroscience lens, long-term chronic bullying can also change our brain. It can really change the way in which our brain functions. So it can lead to more cognitive problems, emotional problems. It can really throw off that stress response system and have a profound negative impact on our immune system functioning. So in some cases, people might be more prone to getting sick and just not feeling well and fatigued all the time too. So brain functioning, we need to be aware of, body functioning. Now, I don't know for sure, but looking at his history and if it's true, I would suspect that there was probably some emotional invalidation going on too in that early family system. So if you look at the literature of today, through an emotional invalidation lens. Emotional invalidation is a form of emotional abuse. It's a form of minimization where maybe someone's excluded or their voice doesn't matter. They feel like they're just marginalized and they're kind of just not respected, valued, known, or heard. So I would absolutely, if I could go back, I would want to know, did he feel valued, known, heard, safe, respected, in his family of origin. That's all through a trauma and attachment lens. Those are so important for anyone today working on any particular case to understand that. Because if the client went through life never feeling heard or valued or known, higher levels of shame, they may put up a wall, more trust issues, more empathy problems, the list goes on and on. Was he rejected? Well, there's an argument to be made there. If he was bullied like that, that severely, probably some rejection, some peer rejection going on. So that's a form of childhood trauma. And in some cases, rejection can erode our self-confidence, our self-worth, and our ability to manage stress. How did he manage stress? I would, If we looked at the FBI classification for profiling, I would say he would fall under the umbrella of an organized offender. There's organized and disorganized. He would be more organized, but what was going on internally? Was he dealing with such a high level of internal distress? He just knew how to, like, to the outside world, look so calm and cool, but inside was what was going on internally. We don't know. Joe, when I did that talk earlier on neurocriminology, I brought up some of the psychophysiological research, like heart rate variability and skin conducted testing. Looking at some of those measures would be fascinating as well. Also, if someone has been rejected, there is a high likelihood that that can contribute to attachment problems. And then what about humiliation too? Clearly, if those people, I wouldn't say abducted him, but like took him against his will and forced him into a doctor's office and then put a skeleton hand over his mouth, he was clearly humiliated in front of people. So if we look at humiliation of today, has anyone ever had a history of cyber humiliation? So that cyber victimization, cyber bullying or public humiliation or school or work or family humiliation, just looking at histories of humiliation is another component of just being aware of how trauma can impact the people you're working with. Through an attachment lens, again, I I would absolutely say he had disrupted attachment patterns on steroids. Obviously, we want to have secure attachment patterns, but unfortunately, a lot of the people we work with in the criminal justice arena don't have solid attachment patterns because they were born into environments where there wasn't a lot of safety and stability. And at the core of trauma-informed care, is safety and stability. So very important when we're looking at this through a trauma-informed care lens, look at it through an attachment lens. 
because securely attached people are healthier. They have less mental health problems. They have higher levels of resilience. People with insecure disrupted attachment patterns might be more prone to having more problems through life. Again, it's different for everyone, but at the base of forming a healthy, solid attachment is that family of origin. Ask yourself this if you're working with any client. Did that client who you're working with grow up in a home where caregivers were responsive to the child's needs, attuned? Were they sensitive? Could that child rely on those parents as being stable and trusting or consistent? Or were these parents just erratic? One minute, they're the nicest person in the world. The next minute, they're the meanest person. Or maybe there was no outward abuse, but the parent was just so checked out with a drug or alcohol problem or disappeared for days on end. Now we have neglect going on as well, which is a form of adverse childhood experience. So at the heart of like secure parenting practices, parents who use warm, sensitive, responsive, and have very clear boundaries with their children, those are good, healthy attachment patterns. What happens if a child grows up in a home and that child's placed in an adult role where the boundaries are really weird and that child's parentified? That can lead to attachment issues as well. There's a million things that can cause attachment problems. But just keep in mind that I would say absolutely this individual had profound attachment problems. And if anyone wants to study attachment a little bit deeper, I would highly recommend reading the literature pertaining to parental responsivity, a topic called mind mindfulness. I would learn about theory of mind and the topic of mentalization, to name a few. And as we move in, I I think it's important to to have a a brief discussion on the topic of empathy because clearly he had empathy problems. He did not see people as people. He saw them as a product, a means to an end. He probably saw them as a way to make money. So if we believe that he had profound empathy deficits, It's very common for people in the criminal justice system to have empathy deficits on some level. I mean, if you're working with someone that is diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder or conduct disorder or psychopathy, there's obviously elements of empathy problems. The question comes up, was H.H. Holmes a true psychopath? I don't want to put labels to it, but he sure had a lot of the traits. So... I'm not going to give it a label or diagnosis, but looking at diagnostic criteria for psychopathy and the literature out there, I would encourage your audience if they want to go deeper into his case study, just look at some of the psychopathy literature. So people that have good empathy, they can share experiences. They can share affect more effectively. They have good cognitive empathy, which is a a component of theory of mind, which is perspective taking and, really understanding the thoughts, wants, needs, emotions, intentions of other people. But then there's a component of empathy called effective empathy, where that's where we use kind of our emotional state. We have better sympathy. I don't know where I heard this, Joe. There's a training I listened to online. I think the the presenter was giving an example about empathy and Data from Star Trek, Next Generation, would be a good example who had cognitive empathy, where you could say it, but did you feel it? Did you feel the effective component? So something to think about. Under Empathy also falls under the umbrella of social cognition, Joe. Social cognition is that umbrella term where it's just how we function in social realms. H.H. Holmes by all accounts, was mainly a loner and got bullied and teased because he was socially awkward. Did he have some social cognitive cognition deficits? Well, probably, because if he had empathy deficits, that falls under the umbrella. Moral reasoning also falls under that umbrella. Clearly, he had some issues with moral reasoning. So that's kind of a broad 
spectrum overview of empathy deficits. But if we were to look at the literature of today, what are the consequences associated with empathy deficits? We're more likely to have problems in social relationships. Our interpersonal relationships are not going to be typically as healthy. We might be more prone to getting a divorce or being in and out of relationships if we can't have kind of empathetic responses. It can really lead to breakdowns in team environments and have a profound impact on the workplace. So through an R&R model, I think it's important to obviously understand how empathy could be a factor with that person being able to hold a job. Because if they can't get along with anyone and work in a team, they might get fired quite quickly. People with profound empathy deficits might be more prone to having social communication problems, higher levels of aggression, more likely to feel disconnected from others and themselves. And they might have a real difficult time sharing their own emotional state with other people. So someone with profound empathy deficits who's under a lot of distress may not know how to share with other people around them that I'm feeling scared right now or angry or upset. Something to think about, too, with this case, because if he grew up, H.H. Holmes, and had profound empathy deficits, really didn't have a lot of friends, did he learn how to name and label and process his emotions? And then was he dealing with a lot of internal distress? And that distress just piled up and up and up. And finally, he found something that helped him feel better and regulate dissecting animals, digging up bodies, selling things, and that started to calm him maybe internally. Obviously a very dysfunctional coping strategy, but did he use that as a potential coping strategy early on in life to get through distress? The answer is maybe. And then moral decision-making. When we think of moral decision-making, Think of someone's moral reasoning or moral judgment or their social decision-making or even their ethics. And under the umbrella of moral decision-making, we are going to have perspective-taking. We're going to have empathy. We're going to have elements of emotional intelligence. It's also related to social-emotional maturity. He clearly had problems with moral judgment and decision-making. Anyone that engages in serial killing has problems, obviously, with moral reasoning and decision-making. So something to think about. Joe, I'll stop for a minute. I know I'm covering a lot of stuff. I'd love to just talk briefly about compulsive behaviors and his, the grief and loss issue with his mom. I think that would be something for your audience just to be aware of as well. In 1886, Holmes moved to Chicago and took a job as a pharmacist under the name Dr. H. H. Holmes. Soon afterward, he apparently began killing people in order to steal their property. The house he built for himself, which would become known as Murder Castle, was equipped with secret passages, trap doors, soundproof rooms, doors that could be locked from the outside, gas jets to asphyxiate victims, and a kiln to cremate the bodies. At the reputed peak of his career, during the World's Expo in Chicago in 1893, Holmes allegedly seduced and murdered a number of women, typically by becoming engaged to them and then killing them after securing control of their life savings. Holmes also required his employees to carry life insurance policies naming him as the beneficiary so that he could collect money after he killed them. Holmes sold the bodies of many of his victims to local medical schools. So yeah, any other, again, of those, of those themes that a uh, current practitioner may see in a, in a client or on their caseload that you could connect back to homes perhaps. Absolutely. So I think another component, he had those obsessive tendencies we spoke about, maybe some compulsive behaviors. So just looking at, again, today's research literature around compulsive behaviors, that's really performing an action like persistently over and over again, or just think about, does your client have that persistent, per, really perfect, 
pressure to perform an act repeatedly or a behavior or a thought. And over time, compulsive behaviors can grow and grow and grow. Did he have a tendency to ruminate on some of these behaviors that he did? Probably. Um, Looking at thoughts, urges, repetitive patterns of behavior, sometimes compulsive behaviors, people engage in them to relieve anxiety or relieve other types of negative emotions, or even it really can turn into almost an addictive tendency. So just be aware, I think, of compulsive behaviors or compulsive acts. With him too, we didn't, I, I won't get into this much. I'll just share with your audience what, what factor does fantasy development play? If you want to learn more about fantasy development, I would recommend your audience listening to that first um, episode we did on Albert Fish. I dug a lot deeper into fantasy development, but anytime we're digging into serial killer cases, very important to understand the origins of like fantasy development, especially in relation to c- compulsive or obsessive kinds of behaviors. And then remember, I I just spoke earlier about his mom. There are some accounts that she died early on, and it was very traumatic for him and the other family members. So what role did traumatic grief play in his life, which is another form of trauma? There's just not a lot of accounts. What happened after that? What happened with him and his dad? I I wish I knew. We just don't know. But when we think of the research of today, if a child loses a parent or caregiver, in some cases, that can cause an attachment problem. In some cases, people might be thrusted into the child welfare arena today, depending on the circumstances. It can lead that child with a lot of confusion, a lot of fear, worry, anxiety, uncertainty about the future. It can contribute to increases in trust issues, avoidant behavior, and it can also increase externalizing problems. So those problems that we'll see ex, kind of externalized, anger, aggression, violence, those are some things that we sometimes see. So if you look at parental bereaved youth, so these are youth who lost a child, if you look at the literature of today, depending on the circumstance, again, depending on how much support that individual is dealing with and depending on all kinds of other factors, it could be a risk factor for more mental health challenges, shame and guilt, substance misuse issues, more health risk behaviors, problems just in relationships. But again, I want to reiterate, the overwhelming majority, again, of people with trauma and all of these things going on We'll never do what H.H. Holmes did, but we want to use his case to highlight some of this important research information. In 1893, Holmes was arrested for insurance fraud after a fire at his home, but he was soon released. He then concocted a scheme with an associate, Ben Pitazel, to defraud an insurance company by faking Pitazel's death. After Pitazel purchased a $10,000 life insurance policy, he and Holmes traveled to Colorado, Missouri, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Texas, where they committed other acts of fraud. Returning to Missouri, Holmes was arrested for fraud and briefly jailed in St. Louis. While in jail, he met Marion Hedgepath, a career criminal who agreed to help Holmes in the insurance scheme with Pitazel. Meanwhile, Pitazel moved to Philadelphia and opened a fake patent office to swindle investors. After his release from jail, Holmes traveled to Philadelphia and killed Pitazel. He then convinced Pitazel's widow, who had been aware of her husband's involvement in the insurance scheme, that her husband was still alive later giving her $500 of the money he collected. Worried that some of Pitazel's five children might alert authorities, Holmes killed three of them. Insurance investigators were alerted to the fraud by Hedgepath, and Holmes was arrested in Boston. In 1894, he was tried in Philadelphia for murder of Pitazel and was sentenced to death by hanging. Again, Joe, if we want to recap his life, 
trauma, attachment, grief and loss issues, some obsessional tendencies, compulsive liar, uh, seemed to not have much attachment to any of his wives. He had a couple children. I didn't even get into that. So just lots of attachment stuff, trauma stuff, um, just the way he looked at people, looked at them probably as a product, a way to make money, and the way to keep whatever lifestyle he was doing going. So he really did not seem to have attachment to people, had very little care. It seemed like he had a lot of care for himself, but not care for others. So that's kind of a broad spectrum overview. This is one of the more difficult profiles I've done because we just don't have a lot to go with. And again, there's a lot of speculation. And I think with our, our next one we're doing, I believe, Joe, we're going to be looking into John Wayne Gacy. We got a lot of information on John Wayne Gacy, so we can definitely dig a lot deeper into him. And since he was more in the 70s, we have actually audio and video recordings of him as well. So we'll dig into that case pretty deep. But Joe, any other final thoughts, anything from an R&R model? I'd be curious, just from your lens, anything R&R related that you would cover that I didn't bring up? Well, you did a good job, Jared. And again, with limited information, but of looking at sort of those R&R or criminogenic risk factors and just the ones that you noted in this episode that got my attention. You talked about the early family dysfunction stuff that falls right into that sort of family marital um, domain, along with the fact that he had three wives, tells you a lot about his his relationship with his partners. You talked about the fact that he was bullied as a child. And again, that's kind of an extension. Or you also talked about that. He didn't have a a lot of friends and we know peers are really one of the big drivers of criminality. It's really, you could really boil it down to risky thinking patterns, those um, cognitions, if you will, which you covered Um, And then companions. And then, yeah, other things we can sort of surmise around alcohol abuse, um, things of that nature. Um, Again, I would never assess somebody like this, as you said, particularly a case that's over 100 years old. But the point we're making is you still see these themes of what we're still utilizing today, whether it's from the risk, need, responsivity lens, the trauma lens, uh, the neurocriminology lens, which, again, I really encourage people to to go down that rabbit hole if they want to take a look into the future. And yes, Jared, you mentioned next in our series, we will be looking at John Wayne Gacy. Jared, it just dawned on me, we're doing a Chicago double hitter now between H.H. Holmes and John Wayne Gacy, but... <laughs> that's, that's, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, John Wayne Gacy, Pogo the Clown, so that was his name, but we'll uh, be digging deeper into him next time, so... Yeah, thank you, Joe, for allowing me to chat with you and your audience. Please feel free to share the Holmes uh, article link with folks or anything else I can do or my email. I'll be glad to answer questions if people have. Yep, I'll do just that. I will leave your email along with I'm just going to go ahead and put the link to the Albert Fish episode that we did right within the show notes of this episode. So if you're on your device, you can just look at the description of this show and you'll see included in there a link to the Albert Fish episode that Jared and I have already recorded. Jared Brown of Concordia University, as well as the American Institute for the Advancement of Forensic Studies. I can't thank you enough, my friend. And again, until next time when we do John Wayne Gacy, take care. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone. A big criminologist podcast. Thank you to Dr. Jared Brown for that awesome profile of H.H. Holmes. He has promised I'm going to leave a link for the incredible article that Jared wrote profiling H.H. Holmes. It's entitled H.H. Holmes, one of America's first recorded serial murderers. Jared wrote that on October 2nd of 2015. Again, the link is embedded right within the description of this episode. I'm also going to leave you Jared's email as you... I'm sure are aware Jared is a wealth of information on a variety of topics. So please reach out to Dr. Brown with any or all questions you may have as to the content that we covered today. 
And again, as noted, Jared will be back in the future to profile John Wayne Gacy. Back next week with a fresh episode. In the meantime, you may contact the show or reach out to us through our website, the Paragon Group, LLC.com, for training or presentations as to core correctional skills, implementation, program design, or, of course, the topic of desistance from crime. If you have questions or comments as to this podcast, Feel free to contact the show via our email at thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. That's thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. Remember to follow us through our Facebook and Instagram pages at The Criminologist Podcast. New fun images are being added all the time to those feeds. You don't want to miss out. The Criminologist Media Group is also on Twitter. Give us a follow at Crim Media Group. That's C R I M Media Group. You may also connect with me, Joseph Arvidson, on LinkedIn and follow both the Criminologist Podcast and the Paragon Group on our LinkedIn pages. Hey, lastly, if you've not already done so, check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Criminologist, for additional content as to the themes of this program. I've been mentioning this as of late, but you can now go to our website, theparagongroupllc.com. Look for the little tab entitled Shop, which will give you insights in how to purchase criminologists, coffee mugs, pens, or those awesome refrigerator magnets. And if you believe in what we're doing on the show, if you're part of the movement, please spread the word. Tell a friend or a coworker or a colleague about us. Ask them to subscribe to the podcast. And of course, do so yourself if you've not already done so. And always remember, folks, there's no them. There's only us. The overwhelming majority, again, of people with trauma and all of these things going on We'll never do what H.H. Holmes did, but we want to use his case to highlight some of this important research information. The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, or training opportunities, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. If you enjoyed the show, you can find more content and videos on our YouTube channel, The Criminologist. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Both The Criminologist Podcast and The Criminologist Channel are brought to you by The Criminologist Media Group. Be sure to give us a five-star review, and thanks for listening.